Sir Wilfrid Laurier's legacy looms large in Canadian history, so large that he started to seem more a myth than a man. So let's deconstruct the myth and discover the man. The Laurier family had deep ties to French Canada, stretching back to the 1600s and the founding of Montreal. Laurier's father, Carolus, a land surveyor, loved stargazing and reading. Carolus and his wife Marcel lost their first daughter. Their second child, Henri Charles Wilfrid Laurier, was born on November 20, 1841, in Saint Lin. His mother died young from tuberculosis. When Laurier was 10, Carolus sent him to English speaking New Glasgow to continue his education. Laurier acquired a fondness for English culture on top of his affection for French Canada. He learned to speak fluent English. Laurier fell in love with the classics in French literature, and at a Catholic college showed off his debating skills so much that the priests ended up closing the debate club. Laurier excelled at McGill University. He was tall, handsome, and had an aristocratic flair. Laurier met a piano teacher named Zoe, and one day he mustered up the courage to sing with her accompaniment. But Laurier was often bedridden, terrified he was dying. He had a mind to marry Zoe, but felt that she deserved better than a sickly student. While in university, Laurier got involved with the Montreal Rouge activists and played a large role in easing the tension between this liberal group and Catholic officials. Laurier opened up a law practice in Montreal. When he was healthy, he was eloquent, passionate, and logical, a great lawyer. But he was often sick, and within a few years, he was jobless, broke, and bedridden. After Canadian Confederation, Laurier decided to move to Arthabaskaville, where he opened a law practice. In 1868, he heard that some man was seeking Zoe's hand in marriage, even though her heart was set on Laurier. So Laurier raced to Montreal to propose, and they got married that evening. When the Pacific Scandal blew the Conservatives out of Parliament, Laurier entered federal politics for the first time. At 32 years old, serving as MP for Drummond Arthabasca, Wilfrid Laurier entered the House of Commons. He was a nobody here, with only his words and his wit to set himself apart. He fought for amnesty for Métis hero Louis Riel. From 1874 to 78, Laurier became the leading figure of a new centrist liberalism. Prime Minister Alexander Mackenzie saw this, and appointed Laurier Minister of Inland Revenue. But the Liberal Party itself wasn't doing well, and in 1878, Macdonald's Conservatives came back into power. Laurier was re-elected, but he'd become depressed and disenchanted. He began to focus more on his law practice and the literate, attractive wife of his law partner, Emilie Barthe. In 1885, Riel returned to Canada to fight once more for Métis rights. Ontarians wanted revenge against Riel, and Macdonald ordered him to be executed. French Canadians were outraged, and Laurier became one of the most passionate spokesmen. He gave the longest parliamentary address of his career, calling out Macdonald for his decisions. Laurier also spoke to a massive crowd, describing the conservative handling of the Métis region as Blood, blood, blood. Prisons, scaffolds, widows, orphans, destitution, ruin. The Liberals lost the 1887 election, after which Laurier was chosen as the new party leader. Macdonald managed to beat the Liberals again in 1891. The loss rattled Laurier, and to console himself, he would go for long walks throughout Ottawa and read from his collection of 5,000 books. But he didn't give up. Laurier rebranded the Liberal Party, using his talent for speeches to win over the public. When the Manitoba schools question caused the Conservative Party to self-destruct in 1895, Laurier took the opportunity to speak in favor of minority rights and provincial autonomy. In one of his most memorable turns of phrase, he said, if it were in my power, I would try this sunny way. Old man Sir Charles Tepper fought a fierce fight for the incumbent Conservative Party, but Laurier was seen as the man who could unite Canada's divided peoples. On July 11, 1896, Wilfrid Laurier finally became Prime Minister of Canada. He was 54 years old and Canada's first French-Canadian PM. Laurier carefully picked his cabinet members, finding the best and most talented MPs from across Canada. The days of Bowles' ancient, divided cabinet were in the past. First, he had to restore Canada's economy. Together with Clifford Sifton, the man he chose as Minister of the Interior, Laurier set to work developing the West. Laurier believed Canada worked best as an assembly line, with raw materials flowing from the West to the industrial centres in the East. Laurier pushed for Western immigration with land offers. Canada was truly on the rise. The summer of 1897 saw Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. 
Wilfrid Laurier traveled to England, where he was received enthusiastically, given honorary degrees, and knighted. He was an overnight sensation. During the Jubilee, Sir Wilfrid and Zoe rode through the streets of London directly behind Queen Victoria herself. But his visit here wasn't all pleasure. Laurier had some work to do. British Colonial Secretary Joseph Chamberlain was talking about the superiority of the British race, and Britain was desperate to stay ahead of the two big rising powers, the USA and Germany. Chamberlain wanted to use the British colonies to do this. In Canada, public opinion was divided. Many English Canadians wanted to help Great Britain, seeing it as a chance to increase their power and prestige. French Canadians were opposed. They didn't want to sacrifice their young nation fighting someone else's wars. Laurier hadn't decided, but from the moment he set foot on British soil, the question was in the air. Laurier spoke gently and carefully, but on the day of the Imperial Conference, he stood firm. There would be no Imperial Federation. Canada's destiny laid in the hands of Canadians. Chamberlain's talk of British dominance was wasted on Laurier. Yes, they would still be loyal to Great Britain, but as Laurier said, The British Empire is composed of a galaxy of free nations, all owing the same allegiance to the same sovereign, but all owing paramount allegiance to their respective peoples. When London declared war on the Boers in South Africa, the question of supporting Great Britain came up again. Henri Bourassa was on the rise in Quebec, and he strongly opposed British aid. So Laurier, again, aimed for the middle. Canada would send 1,000 volunteers, but they would be financed and commanded by Britain. Some claimed he was doing too little, some too much, but Laurier stayed firm. Bourassa resigned from the House of Commons in protest. Laurier won the next election with a greater majority. One of the stains on Laurier's term was Treaty 8, implemented by Sifton, which essentially took 840,000 square kilometers of land from indigenous peoples so the government had better access to Klondike gold. Mostos and his younger brother Kinocheo represented the Woods Cree during treaty talks, looking to protect their way of life. But the terms were unfair and led to generations being sent to residential schools. Laurier's next international challenge involved the USA. There had been disputes over Alaska's border. The exact border of the Alaska panhandle was ambiguous, and with the onset of the Klondike gold rush, the stakes became much higher. Laurier pushed for a resolution. In 1903, an international tribunal of six supposedly impartial judges, three American, two Canadian, and one British, would come to a final decision. Each side wanted more land. To Canada's dismay, the British jurors sided with the Americans. A strong anti-British and anti-American sentiment rippled across Canada. Immigrants continued pouring into the West, many British and American, and even German and Ukrainian. Increasing immigration also pushed indigenous peoples further north into less hospitable land, and racist policies, such as the Chinese head tax, prevented other groups from settling here. There's a reason this time has been referred to as the wheat boom. Agricultural products were exploding with wheat, much of which was exported, and Canada's economy was booming. However, Canada was no longer looking like a French and English nation. Henri Bourassa criticized this change with young politician Armand Lavergne, Officially, Laurier was childless. Laurier initiated the construction of a new transcontinental railway, and while this helped the West, it would cause national debt for years to come. In 1898, the Yukon had been separated from the Northwest Territories to better manage the immigrants after the gold rush. But the territories were still massive, and Laurier determined it best to split up the land, creating the provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan in September 1905. Overall, creating Alberta and Saskatchewan was a major achievement for Laurier, but there were difficulties over schools again. It was Laurier's third term, and the Liberals were in trouble. Many prominent ministers were gone, and Borden's Conservatives were vigilant. Canada had changed drastically since Laurier took office, more industrialized, urban, and diversified, and some Canadians felt the rapid development had worsened working conditions. So Laurier attempted to repair the Liberals' relationship with the working class, and in June 1909, he appointed the first full-time Minister of Labour, a rising star by the name of William Lyon Mackenzie King. Laurier never again wanted a British politician interfering in Canadian foreign policy, as in the Alaska negotiations. So in 1909, Laurier created the Department of External Affairs, which was run above a barber shop. The office was transformed over time to a key department, being run personally by the Prime Minister until 1946. After that, the role became a sort of final stepping stone on the path to PM. Despite these positive steps, Laurier truly was in the twilight of his Prime Ministerial career. Nations around the world were developing navies, so in 1910, Laurier passed the Naval Service Bill, establishing the Royal Canadian Navy. 
For conservatives in English Canada, it was a mere tin pot navy, but for French Canada, it was a massive expense and a sign that Canada would be pulled into British wars. Again, both sides were unhappy. Laurier also reintroduced reciprocity with the U.S. He believed free trade on natural items would help farmers, but manufacturers and financiers opposed it, claiming it would sell out Canadian identity, and the Conservatives said Laurier was leading Canada to U.S. annexation. So Bourassa fought Laurier in Quebec, and Sifton helped Borden behind Laurier's back. In the build-up to the 1911 federal election, Laurier attended King George V's coronation. And how differently he felt on this visit to England than at Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee 14 years ago. Then, Laurier was the talk of the town, young tomorrow, Canada's hope. But now he presided over a divided party, betrayed by former friends and labeled a traitor by his countrymen. All Laurier could do was say that, Canada has been the inspiration of my life. Reciprocity and the Navy were issues too large to overcome. The Canadian federal election of 1911 was a disaster for the Liberals. Laurier had led the country for 15 consecutive years, still the longest unbroken term of any prime minister, but now he was back to the seat he had held before 1896, leader of the opposition. Laurier remained party leader for a while. He traveled around giving speeches, re-energizing the Liberal Party through his eloquence and charisma, and making Quebec fall in love with him again. Laurier, as well as many Canadians, chose to renounce partisanship during World War I. He stopped fighting Borden's bills in the House of Commons, until 1917, when Borden implemented conscription. Shortly after the war's end, Laurier had a stroke and became bedridden. Zoe stayed by his side, and he said his last words. C'est fini. Laurier died on February 17, 1919, at the age of 77. It's hard to define Laurier's legacy. Many of his achievements speak for themselves, he guided Canada through its rapid development in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He represented the end of an earlier political age and the beginning of a new one. Indeed, he's popped up in each of our prior episodes. Laurier was a busy man. Laurier was eloquent and moderate, and he valued compromise. He understood both sides of the issues he faced. By 1911, Laurier was perhaps trying to be too many things to too many people. The first six Prime Ministers came from English, Scottish, and Irish roots. Sir Wilfrid Laurier was Canada's first French-Canadian Prime Minister. He served 15 consecutive years as Prime Minister, as well as 31 years as party leader, and 45 years in the House of Commons. All three records stand to this day. Canada grew by one new territory and two new provinces, and its population increased by nearly 50%. Maclean's ranked Sir Wilfrid Laurier Canada's greatest Prime Minister. What are three reasons he deserves this? What are three reasons he doesn't? 